The recent Russian invasion of Ukraine has reverberated across the world and will have a lasting impact on the future. Its unfolding effects are well worth studying. However, I also believe that the conflict can do much to shed light on our understanding of the past and vice versa. Today, I wanted to discuss how the actions of the Russian army can be compared to those of the Roman legions. Specifically, we'll be looking at how topics such as the Casus Belli, logistics, training, and corruption intersect with the nation's ability to wage war. This will be a quite long video, so feel free to use these timestamps to skip ahead. You can learn much more about militaries from the past through our sponsor, Magellan TV. Their series Warrior's Way, for instance, covers the history of a wide range of military units from across antiquity and the Middle Ages, including the forces of the Norse, Scots, Celts, Romans, Templars, Mongols, and more. Specifically, I'd recommend the episode Sigurd Björnson, Viking Exile, which reconstructs the life of a Norseman who made his way through the lands of the Cave in Rus. It's got great historical details and insight, with amazing visuals to back them up. Documentary videos like this are added weekly to Magellan TV, which already has a collection of over 3,000 videos to choose from among the categories of history, science, nature, space, and more. You can watch Sigurd Bjornsson Viking Exile or any documentary that catches your interest by clicking the link in the description below or going to try.magellantv.com slash Invicta to get a one month free trial. Enjoy! I want to set expectations right at the very get-go of this video. To make things perfectly clear, I do not think that armies separated by millennia are directly comparable. The last thing I want to do here is play the role of a lazy armchair general and make an overly simplified video which boils down to the virgin Russian army sucks and the Chad Roman legions are the best. Rather, I want to look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine through the more nuanced eyes of a historian. After all, while history doesn't repeat itself, it often does rhyme, and Rome repeatedly faced some of the same challenges that we see the Russians struggling with today. Specifically here, we're referring to military truisms regarding Casus Belli, logistics, training, and corruption. Let's now take a look at each of these in turn, with comparative examples of their successes and failures. But first, I think it's important to acknowledge the greatest lesson of all, the human cost of war. For perhaps the first time in history, a war is being broadcast to the world in real time by everyday people on the front lines. This brings with it an unprecedented level of exposure to the horror stories of those caught between the gears of a churning conflict. It's honestly been impossible not to cry when faced with even a sliver of what I know the real victims have had to go through. This level of connection is something that is entirely absent from conflicts even just a few decades ago, and certainly those which took place millennia ago. When studying history, and especially military history about the distant past, this human thread is sadly one which routinely gets severed first. Take for instance the campaigns of Julius Caesar. They appear in virtually every form of media. Here on YouTube, and especially among the military history community, they get played on a near endless loop. I'm certainly guilty myself, and will admit that it's easy to get sucked into a study of the fascinating strategies and tactics which make up these important chapters of history. However, in doing so, we often skip over the dark sides of these tales. Take for instance the Siege of Alicia. Everyone who studied the battle knows about Caesar's great walls of circumvallation which starved out the city. But how many know about the detail that he refused to let citizens of the city evacuate through his lines, and instead left them to starve in the no man's land as a way to apply pressure to the defenders? In a similar vein, how quickly do we glaze over the ancient historians who tell us of how Caesar led his soldiers off the leash in vanquished towns to improve their morale, or of how Caesar reportedly boasted with pride that he had killed a million Gauls and enslaved a million more? If televised today, such conflicts would eclipse the level of suffering we are being exposed to through the Ukrainian invasion. Further expanding this thought experiment to all wars in the past, it reveals just how sterilized the presentation of military history can be. By bringing the human element back into focus, we are reminded that war is indeed hell. Full stop. At the same time, it puts me in a tough position as a fan of military history and a content creator who actively feeds the media machine. I think it's important that we always remain on guard against the desensitization to violence, no matter the context. This war in Ukraine, and the other crises of our time, have certainly reminded me of that. It's the reason why our channel produces videos on daily life, and why I will continue to emphasize the human element throughout our story. With this in mind, let's proceed 
in the hope that the human experience of today can help better color our understanding of the past. Getting back on track, our first point of discussion will be about the Casus Belli. So what's the connection here between the Russian and Roman reasons for war? Well, if we take the Ukrainian war as an example, it becomes evident that the reasons for war are actually quite complex and hard to pin down. Some factors include a desire to acquire resources, to establish spheres of influence, to raise domestic support, to carry on historical conflicts, and so on. All of these have stirred up wars across the ages, going back to the Roman period and beyond. If we focus on one potential reason for war, then the Ukraine conflict can be seen as just another chapter in the ongoing struggle between two greater powers over a buffer region which has a long history of shifting borders and allegiances. In the Roman era, a similar situation can be found in Armenia. Here we see a tug of war taking place between Rome and Parthia, with either side exerting geopolitical pressure, backing factions of their choosing, installing puppet governments, and even staging military interventions in the service of greater geopolitical maneuvers. I could go on and on drawing parallels between the reasons for Rome and Russia's various wars. Such discussions though are admittedly not unique to these two cases, and there is a whole field of study within political science which seeks to understand the variables which seemingly govern conflicts between all nations. But there is a danger in boiling such factors down to a simple math equation. Take for instance the ways commentators just a few months ago spent countless hours discussing why the looming Ukrainian invasion was or was not going to happen. For many, including prominent intelligence services, the calculus seemed to show that this was all bluster and hysteria. It's for this reason that the world was shocked when an all-out invasion was indeed launched. Clearly, an important variable had been missed. I would posit that this was the human element, perhaps one of the single most unpredictable things in the world and one which should never be discounted. In this case, it was the will of Putin which mattered most of all. It's why now, you see all kinds of speculation about his mindset, his health, the things that make him tick, and so on. Coming to this understanding today should inform us about the past as well. After all, personality-driven conflicts are nothing new to history. Wars between nations have long been fought based on the mere whims of their leaders. This was especially true in the Roman era. During the Republic, for instance, it was pretty much taken as a given that the greatest perk of reaching the highest office of consulship would be that now you had a chance to steer the armies of Rome as you saw fit. Naturally, each leader would seek to make the most of their short one-year term and thus found almost any opportunity to wage the war in a way that would maximize their personal interests. One consequence of this was that the Roman war machine was famously aggressive as various politicians cycled in and out of the driver's seat. Consuls who were drawing near the end of their term would often lash out to win one less capstone for their career before the next round of elections. This pressure could lead them to make rash decisions, and some of Rome's worst defeats in battle can be traced back to this sort of motivation. At the same time, the pressure might also bring peace, as a general facing recall might want to negotiate the end of a war on his terms to claim full credit before a political rival could swoop in and finish the job. The major powers of the Punic, Macedonian, and Mithridatic Wars were quick to understand that their dealings with Roman commanders were often best carried out with an understanding of the current political situation back in Rome. Without this context, it's easy to imagine how uninformed observers could get whiplash from a consul who one month offered them peace, but the next month, following a re-election, now brought war. Such personality-driven war-making continued to be relevant to the execution of wars into the Imperial Age. A great example lies with the Germanic Wars, whose pacing changed drastically with the cycling of different commanders. On one end of the spectrum was Tiberius. He was known for his slow, methodical approach to campaigns which sought to constrict the enemy into submission with minimal losses. On the other end of the spectrum was Germanicus, who proved far more aggressive in his pursuit of victories no matter the cost, and whose actions drew the following rebuke from the Emperor. Quote, Enough of the success, enough disaster. The battles have been huge and favorable for Germanicus, but he should not forget those grievous and shocking losses by the wind and the waves. I myself, when I was sent into Germany nine times by the divine Augustus, achieved more through diplomacy than through strength alone." One final thought on the matter of war leaders and their casus belli has to do with the concept of saving face. What I'm getting at here is that often wars can get to a point where peace seems to be the preferred option, but this is only possible when a graceful exit is presented. Again, it seems to be a psychological thing, where for instance Russia is clearly in over its head with the invasion, but the cost of admitting defeat is almost seen as more damaging than the current disaster of a situation. 
and without the option to disengage, escalation often ends up being the solution. This same thing can be seen repeating itself in wars across the ages, and it's honestly disturbing to think just how much blood has been spilled for the sake of this variant of the sunk cost fallacy. Once more, I hope you can use this modern example to better appreciate the nature of peace talks in the past. Take for example Augustus' dealing with the Parthians, which climaxed not with some great campaign, but with the negotiated return of Rome's lost eagles among other concessions. Frankly, I find that peace negotiations are woefully understudied, and we would do well to appreciate just how much effort is required to overcome our primitive instincts that push us to fight one another. If this sort of study also interests you, I highly recommend Historia Civilis' video on the Conference of Vienna, which followed the Napoleonic Wars and set the stage for an unprecedented stretch of peace in Europe which lay the foundations for our modern world. You can also watch Matt Colville's video on peace being the exception to the steady state world. But anyways, we should probably move on to our next topic, logistics. Logistics are the means by which the world turns, and yet, when it's done right, goes unnoticed and unspoken. In a way, this should be expected. There's no glory in reporting after all, either in modern media or ancient history, when things are sailing smoothly. Consider for instance, when have you ever read a headline to the effect, the troops are doing fine, they just received their regular shipment of food and water. And yet when supply lines break down, the results can be utterly catastrophic and are certainly newsworthy. The apparent failures at the outset of the Russian invasion are a perfect demonstration of how these effects can absolutely cripple an army. We've seen offensives stall out, unit effectiveness decline, morale crater, and all manner of other problems manifest as a consequence of faulty logistics. Now take these modern experiences and use them to color your understanding of the past. This should make it much more clear why logistics were so important to ancient armies and why any force capable of developing the logistical edge would be far better equipped to wage war. This was in fact one of the greatest reasons for why the Roman army was so successful. Let's discuss. Today, modern commentators sometimes refer to the tooth to tail ratio. The basic idea is that the combat troops are the teeth, while the support staff are the tail. Modern figures can vary significantly depending on what data you look at and how you analyze it, but generally the trend has been for modern conflicts to have around 30% combat troops. This is likely to get lower over time. Having such long tails in this case allows militaries to sustain the deployment of more complex forces over greater distances for longer periods of time and at higher levels of combat effectiveness. The same was true of the Roman legions. They had some of the highest levels of support staff of their age. This was made possible by their control of the Mediterranean sea lanes and river routes, which allowed them to collect vast resources and funnel them into concentrated theaters of war. The way this worked was that when the Roman Republic declared war, the Senate would vote on provisions to provide the required resources for the troops. Once the broad strokes had been outlined, the minutiae would be handled by the quaestors, their staff, and a literal army of scribes. Fulfilling the needs of the army would be achieved by tapping into an extensive network of provinces, client states, and private merchants. Typically the bulk of the food supplies would be provided by the former two, while any shortfall would be covered by the private entities. To get a sheer sense of the scales involved, here's a snapshot of some partial data researchers have managed to piece together, which details the contributions of some client states between 200 and 170 BC. As you can see, supplies would be ramped up over a number of years to sustain the ravenous hunger of an army at war. These would be stored in operational bases and staged in depots along the planned invasion routes. But it wasn't just food which made its way to the theater of war. Massive quantities of weapons and armor were also stockpiled. One shockingly clear illustration of this is during Rome's Arabian campaign, where surviving receipts indicate orders from the military governor that every smith in Lower Egypt would be commissioned to make swords and armor for the expedition. It also wasn't just a case of preparing enough material for the troops to wear on hand. Spares and tools also had to be prepared for the proper maintenance of these items. Clearly the Russian situation is a demonstration of what could happen when you fail to provide your army with the adequate gear or let it fall into disrepair. This was also something the Romans knew well. Take for instance the famed Lorica Segmentata. While it was certainly a flashy, effective piece of kit, it proved prohibitively expensive to produce and especially to maintain. Thus, it actually enjoyed a quite short service life with more basic forms of mail and scale armor being used for longer periods of time. We've got a whole video on Roman material logistics if you want to learn more. 
For now, however, it will suffice to say that it was quite robust and yielded the distinct advantage of allowing the legions to operate in greater numbers over farther distances and longer periods than many of their foes. Based on Russia's recent performance, it seems that the same cannot be said of their army. But let's not pretend that the Romans were perfect in this respect either. Famously, their first foreign venture into Sicily during the First Punic War was marred by supply issues, and there would be a steep learning curve over the years of their expansion. Many, many generals faced defeat when they overstretched their supply lines or failed to sufficiently protect them. One specific Roman example has quite striking parallels to the Russian invasion today. For instance, many will certainly recall news reports of how a massive Russian armored column 40 miles long was imminently bearing down upon Kiev. However, as the days rolled by, it became apparent that this terrifying force was going nowhere. Ukrainian harassment and attacks to the rear had severed its logistics, rendering it effectively useless. Soon stories came out of Russians freezing in their vehicles and even abandoning them entirely. Goliath had been slain without even the need for a sling stone. An eerily similar disaster befell the Romans during Antony's Parthian invasion in 36 BC. Here, some 80,000 soldiers were also engaged in a rapid advance on an enemy capital. In the process, they also trailed along supply lines stuffed with important goods and gear, including an 80-foot battering ram. It was this exposed element that the more nimble Parthian horsemen attacked and completely destroyed. In doing so, the seemingly unstoppable Roman juggernaut ground to a halt and was forced to pull back in a humiliating and painful retreat. For an understanding of what this may have looked like on the ground, I would again suggest that many of the stories we see unfolding in the Russian ranks today are likely to have been echoed in the past. Anyways, moving on to our next topic of conversation, I'd like to discuss training. This is clearly an important aspect of war which, like logistics, often goes unnoticed until shit hits the fan. Russian forces, for instance, have long enjoyed an aura of badassery and boogeyman status in pop culture especially when it comes to the more secretive elite forces. However, the war in Ukraine has very much lifted that veil to expose serious issues with the state of their forces. The issues extend far beyond just training, but for now let's focus on this topic. Take for instance the regular forces. Many are conscripts whose poor levels of training have been well understood by experts even before conflict broke out. They typically do not serve longer than one year, which even under the best of circumstances leaves hardly any time to develop skills necessary for complex modern military operations. Their poor state was really not unexpected. However, people were generally expecting a bit more from their professional forces. In theory, it's been noted that institutionally they are far better off and more reformed than just a few decades ago, and have been able to log active missions across various theaters of war which should have all helped. Yet it seems that these recent efforts to modernize were not enough. Many factors still undermine their training, such as systemic issues of abuse, corruption, and the baggage of operating in an authoritarian state. More specifically, we could look at reports of how Russian pilots, tank drivers, artillery operators, naval firefighters, and other specialists have a far lower number of training hours under their belt than expected, which has led to decreased effectiveness. Such reports are actually echoed in many other militaries, including NATO members, whose militaries are constantly struggling with combat readiness. Perhaps Russia's level of training is not a huge outlier when compared to others on the global stage, but it's certainly lower than where many thought it was, and its faults are simply made all the more apparent when they are the ones actually engaged in a mass televised invasion where the reality of the situation can no longer be hidden by choreographed parade marches. So now, let's compare this to the Roman army. Again, I want to avoid some cartoonish comparison of the virgin Russian soldier and the Chad legionnaire. We can start with some basic concepts here. The first is that warfare is always the best teacher with regards to training. Russian and many other armies are often far better performers towards the end of conflicts than they are at their start. The same was true of the Romans. During the early Roman Republic, for instance, legions would be called up on an annual basis and then released to return to their farms. It was well understood that such green troops were prone to issues of morale and performance, and thus commanders often sought ways to raise their level of readiness before any major campaign. This often included marches, drills, and even small-scale operations to get them warmed up before major battles. Over time though, Rome's constant wars meant that the populace at large was quite heavily trained. This was especially true in the years following the Punic Wars, when the Republic enjoyed some of the best trained and most experienced armies in history. 
Victory begat victory, and it's no surprise that these soldiers and their commanders went on to steamroll much of the Mediterranean in such a short order. But training in the pre-professional era of the Republic was still an issue. When truly green levies had to be called out during a lull between wars, or for other reasons, they can also be observed to have performed poorly. As an example, we can turn to the start of the Second Punic War. When Hannibal invaded Italy, he bested some of Rome's more competent forces, leaving the Italians to then muster fresh armies of raw recruits. Many historians report of how these men were no match for Hannibal's veteran force, and that Roman commanders, well aware of this disparity, stayed clear of engaging him for so long. It's even been noted by some that the Roman formation at Cannae resulted from the fact that Rome thought its lower quality troops would perform better when balled into a dense formation with simple orders to advance. Yet Hannibal was able to turn this to his advantage by deftly pulling it into his lines, surrounding it, and using its sheer weight against itself. A somewhat haunting parallel to what we see going on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let's now turn to the Imperial Era, where Roman armies transitioned from levy to professional forces. Here the differences were quite stark. Rather than soldiers serving for a year or so at a time, they were now being employed for over two decades. This hugely raised the veterancy of the legions, which can now also spend more of their non-combat time practicing for war. The training itself was apparently brutal and extremely regular. They often carried out marches, entrenchment, formation exercises, and even mock battles. Here is how the contemporary historian Josephus describes it. Quote, their drills are bloodless battles, while their battles are bloody drills. Such high levels of training are one of the key pillars of Roman military success over the years, and this sort of combat readiness is a hallmark of all strong militaries across the eras. Now, let's turn to the last topic of discussion, corruption and the military. When we look at Russia today, it's quite clear that corruption is extremely pervasive and corrosive. This was certainly known before the conflict, but once again the war in Ukraine has unmasked the problem. The examples are countless and far-ranging. In fact, the corruption is intertwined with all other aspects of the video we've discussed so far. It has infected the reasons for war, the logistics, and the training. In terms of the reasons for war, corruption seems to have been a large factor for why the Russian oligarchs were so eager to drain the new victim of Ukraine, and why there was so much misinformation within the higher command levels of the Russian army that Putin seems to have thought that he could even pull off a full-scale invasion in the first place. In terms of logistics, corruption is why so much of the military budget has been siphoned off into the pockets of people all up and down the line. It's why so many corners are cut, why so much inventory is missing, and why any form of auditing or policing meant to address this issue will always fail. One shocking example of a report that I read was that one Russian officer apparently committed suicide when it became apparent that 90% of his reserve tanks had been stripped of their electronics. In terms of training, corruption has also robbed soldiers of the resources meant to raise their combat effectiveness. In addition, there are reports of the mob and other nefarious actors predating upon those who serve. It's no surprise then that the troops come out in the state that they do. Again, this is not uniquely a Russian problem when compared to other armies across the world, but it's certainly not befitting a military which claims to be at the top of the pack. So now let's turn to the Roman army. Was corruption an issue for them? The answer is yes. However, what counts as corruption rather than the normal state of affairs starts to blur when you go back to antiquity. Take for instance the idea of profiting from military conflicts. For a long time, this was one of the primary reasons for waging war. Roman commanders largely waged the campaigns that they did with the expectation that they would reap enormous personal profits from the plunder. The soldiers who followed them also expected this to trickle down on them. We have records of Caesar and many other generals, for instance, promising their soldiers great fortune for their service. This profiteering was to be expected. Even the public seems to have wanted a piece of the action. For instance, the First Punic War, Rome's first campaign overseas, was launched when the Roman consul put the matter of aiding the Mamertines to a vote before the popular assembly. The people were encouraged by prospects of plentiful booty and voted yes, a short-sighted, greedy decision which would trigger decades of war. Yet even in this bandit-style approach to warfare, there were some rules and expectations. The Roman army, for instance, recognized the dangers of how greed could degrade an army's performance. In battle, for instance, victorious units could easily be distracted from further action, such as flanking maneuvers or pursuit, by the temptation to drop everything to despoil the dead or raid the enemy's baggage train. Similarly, 
invasions, and sieges could easily see an attacking army lose cohesion as it spread out to loot everything in its path. This could also pose problems in friendly territory when armies might indiscriminately start stealing from the locals. We have numerous reports of how soldiers could quickly become nothing more than a group of bandits. This in turn undermined its levels of discipline and combat effectiveness. As a result, the Roman army cracked down on the greedy tendency of its forces. They adopted a practice of controlling how loot was collected and divided amongst the men, and disciplinary action could be enforced for those who were in dereliction of their duties. As for the higher-ups, they too might be subject to review, though far less than the regular troops. For instance, there are quite a few examples of where greedy Roman commanders tried to squeeze every penny out of a conflict. This was especially true when it came to taxing provinces. Here, the leader would start with an estimated amount of money that they wanted to make and pass that expectation on to their underlings. These then tacked on their own cut and on and on down the line until you had an effective tax rate much higher than even the greedy number that was first being called for. Things could get so bad that massive rebellions and even wars could break out. Ultimately, it's really only these issues that were of concern to Roman authorities, who were otherwise all too happy to look the other way and line their own pockets with profits. But even when a commander got called out, and even brought to trial on charges of corruption, it was rare that they would get anything more than a slap on the wrist. More often than not, the Roman army simply operated with this corruption baked in. However, there is one prime example of when the corruption was so bad that it derailed an entire military campaign. This was the Jugurthine War. We will definitely have to cover it in further depth in another video. The basic idea though is that in the late 2nd century BC, a Numidian noble by the name of Jugurtha wanted to seize control of his country's throne. To avoid the meddling of the Romans, he bribed a huge number of their officials to turn the other way. When the public grew unsettled by their leaders in action, they pressured the Senate to finally wage war. But Jugurtha again bribed the leadership and the campaign was waged in a half-assed manner. It took riots back in Rome to force the Senate to actually take things more seriously. But even then, Jugurtha continued to bribe generals and officers to slow roll matters. Rumors even arose that they were being paid to lead their own men into ambushes. At one point in this whole saga, Jugurtha was supposedly even summoned to a trial of corruption in Rome, which he promptly bribed his way out of. It's a wild story which pointed to the deep rot beginning to infect the military of the late Republic. I could go on and on with more parallels between the Roman and Russian armies, but for now, this is where I'd like to end our video. I truly hope that this discussion has helped bring the human element to the front of history and allowed this understanding of our present to better color our understanding of the past. A huge thanks to the patrons for suggesting this interesting topic and for helping to fund the channel. You can join our patrons to suggest episodes of your own, vote on topics, and download awesome art from our episodes. Thanks also to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.